name is Chris Howard. I am uh, Digium's training manager. Um, there's a little bit of information about me. I'm DCAP number 2373. Uh, does everybody know what DCAP is? Anybody doesn't know what the, what the DCAP is? It's the uh, Digium Certified Astros Professional. It's a test that you take, and there's two parts to it. Um, I'll actually cover that later, but um, it, it, you're a certified Astros Professional when you pass that test. Um, Again, there's my email address and Twitter and LinkedIn. If you're interested, uh, I did leave the office without my business card, so if you need to get in touch with me, uh, I'll write it down for you. Um, I've kind of modified the schedule up here just to, to show the changes. Um, not real sure why they were changed, but they were. Um, one thing of note is lunch is now at 12 and not 12.15 like it was online. And it's going to be inside in the main building. Uh, so you'll leave here and go through the doors to the main building. It'll be right there on the left. Um, and then the rest of the uh, sessions for the Astros um, from scratch will be the same. So this. One is uh, the intro to Asterisk, this uh, module. And the goals for the um, module are to describe what Asterisk is, uh, what Asterisk can do, who was Digium, <laughs> and uh, who is Sangoma. Um, before we get started, uh, I'll give you a little background on my experience with Asterisk. Um, I, I've been developing applications for Asterisk for 15 years now. Um, I, prior to that, I worked for Nortel Networks, and then we saw Asterisk. I grew up in Huntsville, when we saw what Mark Spencer was doing with Asterisk and uh, how disruptive that technology was going to be. So we started a company to implement Asterisk solutions. Um, and I did that for about 13 years, and then moved over to Digium and became their training manager. Um, so one last thing we'll do with this module is also go over a few use cases for Asterisk. How can you use Asterisk? Uh, it, they're very basic use cases. Asterisk does a lot more than what we'll show you here. So what is Asterisk? It's an open source communication platform. A lot of times people will say, you know, Asterisk is a PBX. Well, yeah, Asterisk can be a PBX. But Asterisk can do a lot more than just be a PBX. It can be um, like a, a message um, platform to send out notifications for your prescriptions ready. You know, it can, it can do a lot of other things rather than be just a simple business PBX. Um, Asterisk is just software that can turn any ordinary PC into a communication server. As a matter of fact, this demo I'm using today is running off this small Intel Nook. Um, it doesn't have to be a powerful PC, or not even a PC. Uh, it doesn't have to be a powerful computer to actually do uh, basic communication services. As a matter of fact, I actually have Asterisk running on this uh, Raspberry Pi right here. And maybe later on we'll demo how well it works. Uh, you can set up an office using a Raspberry Pi, no problem. Asterisk is open source, which means that all the source code is available for you to look at, dissect, uh, change, modify, um, enhance. Um, but Asterisk is released under the GPL. Uh, everybody familiar with the GPL? Do public license? Um, it, there, there's a sticky clause with the GPL that says that if you do modify the source code, then you are required to make your modifications available to anybody that you give the binary to. So it kind of keeps you from doing proprietary things with uh, GPL software. Now, if you were using it in the house and you did make changes to asterisk and you weren't giving it to anybody else, no problem. You do not have to make that source code available. But as soon as you give the uh, software to somebody else, you have to give them the source code. Um, so again, what is Asterisk? Uh, it 
it's a communication platform that can do traditional PBX style um, communications. You can also create a VoIP PBX. You can do other things such as calendaring, you know, email, instant messaging through Asterisk. Um, there are a bunch of web apps that are built on top of Asterisk that can do uh, maybe web RTC, those type of apps, and video chat. So this is the slide that always comes up that I, I really hate, but since uh, Digium is from Huntsville, Alabama, and that's the home of Marshall Space Flight Center, we always have to have a rocket in our uh, presentations. So for this slide, uh, what we're saying here is Asterisk is the platform, the, the uh, launch platform, and the rocket is what you build with Asterisk. So uh, let's look at a, a simple application using Asterisk. But first, let's look at a simple application using Apache, where Apache is an open source web server. Uh, Asterisk is an open source communication platform. So here's a simple hello world written in HTML that Apache can serve up. And in your web browser, you'll see hello world if you hit the URL for that web app. Similarly, Asterisk being a communication server, we can write a communication application using Asterisk dial plan that will play back hello world. Uh, when you dial, in this case, when you dial extension 100, it'll answer the call, it'll wait a second, it'll play back hello world, and then hang up. Let's see if we can do that. I'm not sure how loud this will be. Hello world. I think it's loud enough. <laughs> So what are uh, some of the characteristics of Asterisk? Um, it's a uh, pretty mature software. It's been around for over 18 years, um, approaching 19, if not already 19. So in the software world, that's, that's very mature software. Um, plus, there's been over 10,000 developers for Asterisk over these uh, 18 or 19 years. Lots of eyes have looked at the source code. It, it's, it's very solid software. Um, it's enterprise ready and reliable. Performance has definitely increased over these 19 years. Uh, early versions of Asterisk did suffer from some performance hits, but all of that's gone now. Uh, global community. Um, we estimate there's over a million production servers. We have no way to really back that up. Um, we just know how many downloads per day we get and kind of extrapolate that out. Uh, you also have to wonder what is a production server? You know, is it, if I set up Asterisk at home and it does my voicemail at home, is that a production server? Well, yeah, kind of, but you know, Measuring the actual deployments of Asterisk is very difficult, being an open source platform. Um, you know, there is no phone home in the uh, software itself that tells us this IP address is actually using Asterisk. It is licensed under the uh, GPL version 2. Uh, again, if you're interested in that, you can go look that up on the internet. There's plenty of information about it. It um, can be controversial, but uh, it's the same license that Linux uses. You can also get a commercial OEM license for Asterisk. Say you want to build a white box application using Asterisk and you're going to build some proprietary modules or you want to build proprietary modules and you don't want to have to release the source code to that. You can come to Digium or Sango in the case and say, hey, I would like to pur purchase a commercial license for Asterisk and they'll give you some magic number and you can pay it and not have to uh, release your modifications to Asterisk. It is supported. There is community support, there's forums, there's uh, mail lists, there's IRC chat sessions, there's Discord servers, lots of uh, community support for Asterisk. Uh, it's also, there's commercial support, either through Digim, Sangoma, or who knows, you know, hundreds of other companies that provide Asterisk support. 
So let's go over a little timeline history of Asterisk. Um, back in 1999, uh, rumor has it that um, Mark Spencer, he, he had a company called Linux Support Services and they were a growing company and they, they provided support for Linux, just like the name says. And they had a, like four telephone lines coming into their office and they were getting more calls than those four lines could handle. So they decided they needed to go out and buy you know, a real PBX that can do some call queuing type uh, functionality. Well, he went out and priced them and the Panasonics and Nortels and Lucents and all of that were super expensive. He, he you know, couldn't afford to, to actually go buy one of these uh, servers. So Mark being Mark, he just said, well, I'll write my own. And he did and released Asterisk 0.1 in 1999. And over the next four years, um, it matured quite a bit. That's when most of the applications for Asterisk were built, the you know, email app, the uh, Q app, the you know, conference bridge app, meet me. All of that was written in that time frame. Um, and it really took off. And that, that, that was about the time we realized how disruptive this software was going to be. And we started our own company of doing deployments. Um, Mark at uh, Linux Support Services was overwhelmed. They couldn't handle all the calls requests for um, doing deployments of Asterisk. So he'd start handing those off to us. So we were kind of like the deployment side of, of Linux support services at the time. And we started building custom solutions ba based on Asterisk itself. So in 2004, the software it's became stable enough to actually do a 1.0 release. Um, that was quickly followed up by 1.2 release, which added a lot of stability. And then 1.4 was really known as a very solid release of Asterisk. Um, anybody still using 1.4? I hope not. <laughs> This is the first session that nobody's raised their hand and go, yeah, I'm, I'm still using 1.4. Um, it, it, it was such a stable release that it, it just hung around. People would not quit using it. Um, so shortly after that, in 2008, the 1.6 branches appeared. Um, there was a lot of internal changes in these 1.6 uh, branches. A lot of the data structures inside of Asterisk changed, and a lot of the APIs between the modules changed as well. So modules written for 1.4 didn't port over to 1.6 very easily. You know, it was, it, was, it was a lot of work. And that's one of the reasons people stuck with 1.4 was these architectural changes under the hood. So 1.6.0, 1.6.1, and 1.6.2 were actual independent releases. They weren't like bug fixes. They started, they kind of changed their numbering scheme at this time. Um, in 2010, Asterisk 1.8 was released. That was the first LTS release, which is a uh, long-term support and very popular release as well. Any 1.8 users out there? We got one. All right. <laughs> you need to upgrade. <laughs> it is no longer supported. Um, Asterisk 10 came out, which was a standard release. Uh, then Asterisk 11 came out. And this was kind of like the last release, release before um, a, another round of internal changes were made to Asterisk. Asterisk 11 was a LTS release, and I would imagine there's probably a couple here still using Asterisk 11. And again, I recommend you upgrade. Um, Asterisk 12 was a standard release, release that included the first version of the PJSIP channel driver for asterisk. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it also included some the ARI interface. So they changed some internals there to allow you to access the, the low level primitives inside of asterisk using a um, RESTful interface. Asterisk 13 is a LTS release and it is still supported. Um, so I would imagine there's quite a few out there that are currently using Asterisk 13. Then we had Asterisk 14, which added a lot of WebRTC 
uh, capabilities to asterisk. It was a standard release. Uh, asterisk 15 was released after that, which actually had more uh, internal changes, so much more that the developers were not um, wanting to release it as a LTS release. Uh, usually it was like 11's LTS, 12 standard, 13's LTS, 14 standard, 15 should have been an LTS, but it wasn't based on those internal changes. So they decided to wait till after 16 to be an LTS release. And what they did is they actually extended the support for Asterisk 13 LTS another year to make up for that year that the Asterisk 15 was not an LTS release. And what are uh, LTSs versus standard releases? Um, an LTS, uh, I mean the standard release has one year lifespan plus another year of security fixes. So pretty much you have support for two years security wise on a uh, standard release. Whereas uh, LTS gives you, uh, I think it's four years plus a year of, um, of security bug fixes. Again, noted that um, asterisk 13, we added a year to that just to make up for the asterisk 15 not being a uh, LTS release. And I have not seen the announcement. Has anybody seen an announcement for asterisk 16? I was expecting to get one first thing this morning. Uh, yeah, it should be released today. Um, and it is a LTS release. So currently, the supported versions of Asterisk, if you look at the orange line there, Asterisk 14 fell off of took any kind of support um, earlier this month. Asterisk 15 is bug fix only now. And the supported versions, are Asterisk 13, we still have full support on it, as well as Asterisk 16. Um, anybody using Asterisk 15? Interesting. So what's new in Asterisk 16? A lot of work was done to um, fix a few issues with the WebRTC code. Um, there was issues where with drop packets, it would kind of make the person in the video kind of jump from one side of the room to the other, and strange things happen when, when we were losing packets. So they've added some code to actually insert these packets that were missing, which makes things a lot smoother. Uh, you might see a little glitch, but it's better than a person jumping across the room uh, in one frame. Um, PJ SIP performance. Uh, last year at Astrocon, there was a session on somebody did, I, I don't remember who it was, uh, but they measured the performance of the old SIP channel driver versus PJ SIP. And there were certain aspects of the old uh, SIP channel driver that were much faster than PJ SIP. So the uh, Astrocon developer development team looked at the results and kind of went in and made it a goal to. Uh, increase the performance of PJ SIP. Since uh, the old Chan SIP driver is on extended support, it's not, not really supported by Digium anymore. Um, if there's a security issue, they'll fix it, but otherwise they won't touch the code. And the main reason being uh, the old Chan SIP had like 32,000 lines of code in one file, where PJ SIP has like 50 modules and they're all small and maintainable and it's easy to work on the PJ SIP channel driver where the old Chan SIP channel driver, the developers wouldn't want to touch it because they'd fix something over here which would break five things over here and um, it became a maintenance nightmare. So that's the reason for changing over to PJ SIP. Um, a lot of people have resisted moving up to PJ SIP mainly because the uh, configuration files look scary. Um, once, once you get into it, it really makes a lot of sense. It took me about a week of sitting there and going, what is this? Why did they do it this way? And then after about a week, it kind of clicked and go, well, this makes complete sense. Um, it's, it's more of a relational data model rather than a, um, trying to force fit that into a, like a one context for a, a SIP device. 
The uh, Apariginate, if you're interested, uh, there's a new A option for that, that uh, for asynchronous calls. In other words, the application will return immediately after the Originate was issued rather than uh, be blocking. Um, anybody interested in queues within Asterisk, uh, there's a, the wrap-up time can now be configured per queue member instead of per queue, which I think uh, quite a few people will be happy about that. Um, and then the PJSIP, the AMI events for PJSIP and actions have been extended. Um, there's some actions to show the different record types. So let's look at a few use cases for asterisk. Um, we have the traditional analog PBX where you have analog phones and they connect up to the uh, Mobile net telephone network using maybe T1s or analog lines and it works just like the old telephone systems that have been around for years. Uh, asterisk can do that. You can also build a voice over IP only PBX where you use VoIP phones or soft phones um, and you trunk your traffic over the internet to a uh, internet to a me service provider and they terminate it to MyBell uh, for you and you're all IP at that point. You can also create hybrid uh, PBXs where you have some analog phones, some SIP phones, um, you have a, maybe a T1 connection to uh, the telephone network as well as a VoIP trunk to some provider. Um, and you can have multiple offices that connect up through the internet or through the, uh, the public telephone network. So uh, those that already have it deployed, are, are, are you guys mostly uh, voice over IP only? No? Still some old analog phones and analog trunks? They, won't, they don't seem to go away, do they? <laughs> There's still a lot of T1s out there in use. And they work. I mean, they don't go down. They, they're, they've got that uptime for them. Um, a lot of, uh, you can also use Asterisk as a toll bypass. So maybe you have your old traditional um, Panasonic uh, PBXs out there, and your boss loves them and wants to keep them. You know, paid a lot for the phones. Um, so you don't want to have to go out and buy a bunch of new VoIP phones or whatever. whatever. For whatever reason you want to keep your PBXs, you can actually place asterisk off to the side and um, use it to trunk calls over the internet and not pay long distance fees. Um, this is done quite a bit actually. Uh, and you can even use, Digium tells these little gateway syndrome as well, um, that they, they are T1 in and SIP out, so you could use one of those devices to uh, trunk over the internet as well. And maybe terminate, terminate your calls through a internet telephone service provider rather than using one of the uh, Bell networks over a T1. Asterisk can be used as a feature server. So again, your boss has his old Nortel phone system he loves, and he loves his Nortel phone. He's got this big phone with a bunch of buttons on it, and he doesn't want to give it up. But he wants uh, conference bridging. So y'all call up Nortel and realize, hey, Nortel doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> How are we going to get conference bridges on our Nortel uh, PBX? So what you can do is you can just have an Aster instance off to the side, and when you dial a certain number, it can trunk over to that Astro server and you can use Confbridge and set up conference bridges outside of your Nortel PBX using Asterisk. Um, maybe, maybe you want to expand your voicemail capabilities and you can't do that with your older PBX. Asterisk could be your voicemail server as well and you can keep your old PBX. Anybody doing anything like this? Nope. I think at this point most people just go ahead and bite the bullet and go straight to uh, asterisk, right? 
uh, call centers. Uh, Asterisk has an application, which some call the killer application for Asterisk, which is AppQ, which allows an ACD or automatic call distribution. Um, you know, it's um, your number 10 in line, your call will be answered in the next 30 minutes, whatever, but those type of call queues. Um, it also provides call monitoring. Maybe you have a call center manager that wants to monitor in, listen in on the calls, make sure everything's going okay, or maybe whisper to the agent, you know, what they should be saying to the uh, person on the other end. Uh, you can do skill-based routing both with the, with the uh, agents and the queues themselves. So maybe you have a bunch of people that know Windows and a bunch that know Linux. The Linux guys could be added to the Windows queue and, and they would only be called if all of the Windows guys were already busy. They could um, be like, you know, just a voice that could talk to the uh, people from the, out of the queue, um, even though they're not an expert in Windows. Um, and then there's a lot of failover and contingency solutions for app queues. A lot of those are um, third party type applications. So, asterisk in the enterprise, um, see this done quite a bit. Maybe you have, you know, 3,000 phones within your company and you want to build redundant systems or, or high availability type solutions. You might have all your phones either out on the internet somewhere or in the office that, that will actually register to come to ILIO servers. Um, anybody familiar with those? We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but what they'll, they are is registration routing servers. And then what they'll do is they'll send the calls based on the number dialed to the appropriate asterisk server, where each of these asterisk servers do just one certain thing, like a IVR server or a, your, your call center queue server or a voicemail server. And then they can all use a um, <coughs> the same database to know how to route and, and where the different servers are and, and those kind of things. This, this is done quite a bit. And if you want to know more about Kama Ilio, there's a session on Wednesday uh, at 3 o'clock. And it lets you know when you're big enough or when you should use Kama Ilio as a registration server or a routing server. Probably a pretty good session. I think I'm going to sit it on that So who was Digium? <laughs> um, Digium was the Astros company. Um, founded by Mark Spencer, like I said earlier, uh, as Linux support services. Had a two-fold mission to um, provide support for an Astros open source project, as well as sell commercial products based around Asterisk. About 200 employees. Um, headquartered in Huntsville, Alabama, and with the offices in Atlanta and San Diego, and we have remote workers in Canada and Wyoming and you know, a few different places. Um, again, everybody probably knows this, that uh, Digium was acquired by Sangoma in September of this year, last month. And there is a wiki page for Digium that will tell you a little bit more information. Um, what, what are Digium's business products? Uh, Switchbox, be it in the cloud or uh, on-premise. Uh, Switchbox is the, um, the bells and whistles PBX with the GUI. You know, you configure it all yourself with the web-based GUI. That, that, we have the switchboard app that lets you see your calls and, and drag and drop calls between phone. Um, it's kind of like the, the Cadillac of uh, PBXs in the asterisk world. Um, then Digium also has developer products. Um, so they build hardware, be it phones or gateways. I stand right here, it gets worse. <laughs> um, they have phones, gateways, and uh, interface cards, T1, 
interface cards or analog cards, uh, the T1 cards have up to eight ports on them, I believe, eight T1s, and the analog cards can do up to 24 ports, analog via FXS or FXO. We also provide support. You can buy a subscription for support or on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you can also uh, get 24-7 support. Um, Digium is the maintainer of Asterisk. So we have developers working full-time on Asterisk and, and, and shepherding the development product process with all of the open source developers out in the world and doing bug fixes and all of that kind of stuff. Um, that, that goes on on a daily basis. I don't remember exactly how many developers we have in-house working on Asterisk, but it's, it's quite a few. Um, and then training, that's where I come in. Uh, we have four different training courses at, Ast at Digium. We have the Asterisk Essentials class, which is an online class. Um, it's currently going through an update to uh, reflect the changes from the old ChanSIP to the new PJSIP channel driver. Then we have the Asterisk Fast Start, which is a three-day course. It's kind of like an introductory course to Asterisk. Uh, and then we have the Asterisk Advanced course, which is a five-day, pretty much hands-on, build out an Asterisk server with using all the different Asterisk applications. And then we have a class called Asterisk APIs for Developers, where we go through the different APIs, the, the Asterisk Gateway Interface, Asterisk Manager Interface, and Asterisk RESTful Interface, and we go through showing you how you can use those APIs to build a custom solution based around Asterisk, maybe integrating in with your CRM system or some other system within your enterprise, or, or building, like I said, building just a custom communication application using these APIs. We do have two certifications, the uh, DCAA, which is the Asterisk Administrator. Uh, you can take that one online. You can take it at any time as you would like. It's free. Um, it consists of, I think, 80 questions. Um, then we have the DCAP, which is the Asterisk Professional Certification. And what it is, is a, there's a written side where there's like 120 questions multiple choice questions, and then a practical side where you actually get a spec sheet and we'll say, here, go build me this. And you have to, to build uh, a solution based on that spec sheet and build it out of Asterisk. We are offering the DCAP here at Astricon. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to the front desk and sign up. Um, it will offer it Wednesday and Thursday at various times throughout uh, Astricon. So, that being said, who is Sangoma? They are known as Sangoma Technologies Corporation, uh, founded in 1984. They are the free PBX company. They uh, are the maintainers and keepers of free PBX. Free PBX users here? Qu quite a bit, yeah. Um, so now they're the free PBX company and since the acquisition of Digium, they are the Asterisk company. So they got both under their umbrella. Um, they have products for unified communication solutions. Um, similar to Digium Switchbox, they have their, their own solution similar to that. Um, they also have a whole line of hardware solutions, be it gateways or interface cards or phones. Um, they're headquartered in Canada. So I used to work for a Canadian company at Mortel <laughs> Networks and now I work for another Canadian company. Um, they do have a Wikipedia page. And for anybody that's interested, um, in this room right here at 320, there's going to be a Ask Them Anything panel discussion. There will be people from Digium, people from Sangoma. If you have any questions about the merger, the acquisition, um, or the products, or just anything about the, the uh, buy, uh, um, Sangoma buying Digium, uh, I'd recommend you come to this uh, discussion. I imagine this room will be packed out. <laughs> so you might want to keep your seat. Um, but yeah, there's there's... I think a panel of about six people, some high-level developers, um, CTOs, and 
and those types that will answer any questions you have about it. I'll be here for that one. Um, a few of the uh, Sangoma solutions, they, they have the PBX or PBX Act cloud and on-premise similar to the um, Digium Switchbox solutions. Then they have the, of course, the free PBX phone system. And today, uh, if you're interested in free PBX, there's a session at 2.35 uh, that will talk about uh, past, present, and future of uh, free PBX. But you don't want to go to that. You want to stay in this class, this session. Now, you, you might be interested in, in going to that if, if you're a uh, free PBX user. Uh, they also have multiple gateway products, which are T1 to SIP interfaces. Uh, for the enterprise all the way down to the carrier level dialogic uh, media gateways that can handle lots of T1s and lots of SIP endpoint. They do sell uh, IP phones, voice over IP phones and cell phones. They have a line of T1 analog cards and even transcoding cards. So if you're transcoding like G729, they have cards that will do offload that from the CPU over to the card and, and make it where you're not really taxing your BBX CPU. Okay. We talked a little bit about what ASUS is, what it can do, a little bit about Digium and Sangoma, and that is the first one.